It's happened to you before? The Constantine movie back in 2005 was the first time that I can really remember personally seeing comic book fans getting up in arms about a casting choice. What's wrong? With Keanu Reeves cast in the role of John Constantine. The role of a British guy in a trench coat being played by an American in a black and white suit didn't sit well with the more devoted fans of the Hellblazer comic book series. Go to hell. And I don't know if people remember or don't even know to begin with either, but after the Matrix movies, Keanu really didn't have the best run when it came to acting roles. I mean, aside from a few highlights here and there, Scanner Darkly, it really wasn't until John Wick came out in 2014 that the guy's career really took off again. Although Constantine was successful enough and did become a bit of a cult classic, it was far less than what it could have been had it come out in what's more or less the guy's second heyday. And as much as people often forget the movie existed, it's even more likely they forgot that there was a game based off it as well. Then check this out. Yeah, aptly named Constantine the Video Game, released in 2005 for the Xbox, PS2, and Microsoft Windows. And it'll also surprise absolutely no one to know that it was released around the same time as the movie, which in no way meant that the game was rushed or hurried along to meet a strict deadline. That was sarcasm, by the way. Developed by Bit Studios, who formerly worked on Die Hard Vendetta, it came out to pretty lukewarm reviews, and almost 20 years later, you'd be hard-pressed finding people who even know it exists. Really, John? Do tell. And look, I might be a little bit late with this one for Halloween, but with the somewhat recent news that they're going to be making a sequel to the original movie, and also the fact that there's not much else going on in November, I thought I'd go back to the past to play the shitty games that suck ass. Show me. Or so I thought, because unlike a lot of other movie and TV show tie-ins from that era, Constantine is actually not that bad. And definitely not worth all the 5s and 6s out of 10 that it seemed to get back then from journalists. Get some lucky doll. Right, so before I get too far into things, I do need to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership that delivers boxes of awesome, top shelf goods from under the radar brands right to your doorstep. It's free to join, and you can also skip a month or cancel it at any time. 90% of these products all come from small brands, many of which are based in the US, like Forge, an awesome Damascus steel knife made by Buck and Bear Knives located in Pennsylvania. Or Carnivore, a really cool barbecue rub made by the Great American Spice Co. in Rockford, Michigan. And every month they're adding all new products like outdoor gear, home and kitchen goods, clothing and even fresh seafood, all of which is based off a preference quiz. Each box has around 70 bucks worth of goods inside, which only costs you a fraction of the value. And you're able to preview each box before it's shipped. You know, in case you decide you don't want to keep it, or even just skip that month, both at no extra charge. So to get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter the checkout code GmanLives20. Or go to bespokepost.com forward slash GmanLives20. Right, so the story is kind of interesting here in the way that it is replicating the events of the movie, but then on the other hand, it's also kind of not, changing things up in some pretty fundamental ways. The main cast is still comprised of John, Angela, Papa Midnight, and Balthazar, and the whole thing's still about John preventing Lucifer's son, Mamon, from being unleashed on Earth. This all adds up to a bad moon arising, John. Some of the actual actors from the movie even returned to do the dialogue, namely Tilda Swinton as Gabriel and Gavin Rossdale as Balthazar. Direct. Blunt. Oh, so human. But for some reason, Keanu Reeves turned down the role of John. He would have gotten in the way. Instead, they got a guy named William Hope. Yeah, Lieutenant Gorman himself from Aliens. Oh, great. Wonderful. Shit who actually does a pretty good impression of Keanu overall, without it sounding too much like an SNL skit. Is that what your whole industry is about? Forgiving rule breakers? The biggest omission is Shia LaBeouf's character, Chaz, who's just missing entirely. But all this really affects is the final chapter in the hospital, where instead of Chaz putting a crucifix into the water tank, John does it himself. Let's see how the hell scum like a holy shower. And instead of the whole plot focusing on finding the spirit destiny, not to be confused with the 1992 FPS of the same name, it's now also about John and Father Hennessy investigating the murder of an angel named El Ryu, which eventually ties in with the whole Gabriel and Balthazar plot with Angela being a civilian just caught in the crossfire. 
In fact, there really is like an unusual amount of cinematics here, most of which aren't half bad, all things considered, and it goes a long way in making the whole thing feel less phoned in. Someone is playing games with you, Constantine. There's some pretty edgy shit here too, man, like levels set in a mortuary surrounded by a bunch of dead bodies, and then another one set in a police station that's become overrun by demons which makes the police station shootout in the Terminator seem like a PG-13 film in comparison. Either way though, you probably don't need to have seen the movie beforehand, but it is kind of interesting seeing how they've tried to work with whatever limited materials they were given when developing the game. Considering too that if history is any kind of indicator, then the game devs are often expected to get blood from a stone when it comes to these kind of tie-ins. <coughs> Asshole. Now, it wouldn't be a very fun game if John just spent all the time sitting around, acting moody and smoking cigarettes, so they've done what is the most sensible thing to do here and just make this into a pretty basic third-person shooter. Having said that, though, there is quite a lot of mechanics that they've got on offer here. From the simple things like drinking water from a holy flask to refill your health points, through to using holy relics as weapons, like scraps of cloth taken from Moses' robes. John's even got like a very Max Payne inspired spin move, slowing down time so you can react quickly to people trying to sneak up behind you. They've even opted to remove the basic ability of just being able to jump, instead having John jump automatically when you reach the edge of a ledge. And believe me, that's an outright blessing. So first things first, the weapons, and there's definitely a sense of it being quality over quantity here, if not obvious by the fact that there's only five in total. You start off with a couple of giant revolvers called the Witch's Curse, and these do decent enough damage, though John fires them so slowly that I'm starting to wonder if he's suffering from arthritis as much as he's suffering from emphysema. The only time I really used these was earlier on, mostly because I didn't have any other guns to choose from, and if you're low on ammo, you might want to use them as a fallback, but it quickly gets replaced by bigger and better weapons. Speaking of, after that, there's the Crucifier. An old toy of El Rius. I could use this. And I still can't tell if that's the best or worst name for what's more or less a nail gun in a religious themed shooter. Next. Crucifixion is good. This is also kind of the closest you get to an actual assault rifle or an SMG, and the only downside to it is that the more you fire it, the more it decreases the firing rate. You do have that benefit though, being able to run around and pick up all the nails you shot off though, which is a nice touch. There's also two upgrades you can find for this thing as well, one which sets the nails on fire to do extra damage, and then another one which causes the nails to ricochet off surfaces into nearby enemies. So, you know, if your aim really does suck that much, you can at least get some kind of consolation out of it. The next thing you get is the Dragon's Breath, which is more or less like a handheld flamethrower, which you funnily enough come across in hell. A primordial flamethrower. Dragon's breath. And it's one of the weapons you also see John using in the movie for all of five seconds. But this thing right here though is easily one of the best weapons when used properly, just incinerating those weaker demons in seconds. And even some of those tougher mini boss enemies as well, which you will get really used to seeing, but more on that part later. Fuck you! Without a doubt though, the best weapon in the game is the Holy Shotgun. Not only because it's a shotgun, but also because it was featured prominently in the best scene in the movie. Yeah, that scene in the movie where John Constantine turned into John Wick, and blasted his way through a couple of dozen demons with such efficiency that even the Doom Slayer himself would have to give the guy props. The Holy Shotgun does good damage, it fires pretty quickly, and you've also got to love how the pellet spread is in the shape of an inverted cross. Also, there's just something so righteous about sending demons back to their maker with an anointed boomstick. I mean, damn. It's also kind of interesting too, how you first got to assemble this thing by finding all the parts, with it needing three components in total. Another part of the shotgun. As if you're finding the ultimate weapons from Hexen or something. The final shotgun piece. Thanks. And then the final weapon, which you get like maybe halfway or so into the campaign, is just your basic standard crossbow. Trying to hit enemies with this thing though is not one of the game's biggest strengths, mainly because of the hitbox size, but also just because of how choppy that mouse aiming is. But I do again appreciate how you can reclaim arrows from the ground. And that's kind of handy, man, because with this weapon, I'm about as accurate as a goddamn stormtrooper. 
John's also got like this helpful ability called True Sight, which is kind of like the closest thing you get to a night vision mode. Changing the camera to a first person perspective, but also making it much easier to both see and shoot at demons. Sadly though, there's no golden knuckle dusters, which is a bit of a shame. Instead, you're relegated to some pretty basic melee moves, just punches and kicks. Where the combat starts to get a bit more complex though, is when you integrate all the spells that you've got as well. With there being six in total, both offensive and defensive. And at any time, assuming you've got enough magic points, you can cast one of these after performing the proper input, and then just sit back and watch this stuff do its job. Just don't take any damage when you're casting because it completely interrupts the spell and doesn't even refund your magic points. And that right there is what I like to refer to as a whole heap of bullshit. <laughs> They definitely play their hand a bit early here too, I think, because the first one you get is something called Stormcrow, which is an electrical spell that can target multiple enemies at once and then hit them all with lightning bolts, often killing them all instantly. Stormcrow, that's powerful magic. Which is just so powerful early on. And if it wasn't for this unskippable animation every single time you cast it, well, I'd probably use this thing exclusively over all the guns. Aside from that, you've got Confusion, which makes a specific enemy take the form of John to redirect other enemies to attack it, which, yeah, it's kind of cool at first, but not really all that useful. And just kind of infuriate it, zapping everything nearby in the ass with a bunch of lightning. Then later on in the campaign, you'll also find Gargoyle and Demon Leech, with Gargoyle easily being one of the best in the game. Gargoyle has the really handy benefit of turning all nearby non-boss enemies into stone, where you can then shatter them with a single follow-up hit from any weapon, which just becomes downright essential later in the game when they start spawning in dozens of demons at once. Get some lucky doll. <laughs> Demon Leech, on the other hand, is really only necessary against the fight with Balthazar. Oh, sorry, spoilers. Being an outright gimmick that just deflects his very specific attacks right back into his stupid, handsome, well-manicured face. What I actually found out too was that I completely missed a couple of these during my playthrough. Like the one called Hunger, where you can fire out a swarm of insects to attack nearby enemies. Me best up. Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! So it's entirely possible to go through the entire campaign and miss some of these if you're not paying attention. Still though, most of the time here, I just found myself using Stormcrow. That's powerful magic. And then as soon as Gargoyle came along, I pretty much just used that one exclusively, because there's just really no reason to use anything else. And when you consider that you can upgrade your health and magic pool, along with finding all those weapon upgrades, it starts to show you that they've actually made like a surprisingly deep combat mechanic, even if it is kind of repetitive. And the reason I say that is because you're really not doing all that much more than just shooting the same few enemy types over and over for every single level. Now, the movie itself had some pretty good action scenes, but those kind of moments were few and far between, and it's not really the kind of thing I'd think you would call action-packed. Well, don't despair, because they've taken the complete opposite approach here in the video game. And when the game's not doing its best to try to scare you with all these scripted sequences, it's throwing droves and droves of bad guys at you. Most of these are just some form of a scavenger demon, pretty basic run-of-the-mill enemy that just runs around and hits you whenever it gets close enough. If you've seen the film, you'll probably remember these guys. They're the ones that look like they're head-butted and edge grinder, and you'll instantly recognize seeing them in-game. And about the only strategy you need here is just shoot at them until they die from it. The most irritating ones I found, though, are funnily enough the smaller and the weaker ones, because they've got this really annoying habit of jumping out and latching onto John. And that right there is really one of my all-time biggest pet peeves when it comes to enemy behavior in video games, along with enemies that can knock you over and suicide-style kamikaze enemies too. They try to mix it up somewhat with these tougher variants that can dodge some of your attacks or have bladed arms or zip all over the place, but you can counter all of that with a well-placed shotgun blast to the face. One of the demons that absolutely stuck out to me though was an enemy called the Bile Riz, simply because this thing is more or less the Infectors from Dead Space. Go to hell. 
They're weird, bat-looking demons that hop onto the backs of corpses to possess them. And simply killing the host isn't enough, you've also got to kill the Bile Riz. Otherwise, they just scamper away and possess another corpse. Yeah, sounds familiar. So you can either just kill the host, which forces it back out again, or cast an exorcism spell then just call it a day. And if the infectors aren't at least inspired by these things to some extent, well, then I'd be really surprised. What the hell? Then there's another demon which has a giant weak spot on its back and can only be killed when baited in the opposite direction. Classic. Probably the most annoying ones though are the aptly named Bastardos, enemies that spam fireballs and then teleport away after taking too much damage. They're incredibly frustrating to fight and when there's like 3 or 4 of these guys to contend with, along with half a dozen of whatever else is in the room at the same time, then it just becomes an absolute shitstorm. I mean, enough with the goddamn fireballs. Then aside from all of that, you've got all the half breeds to contend with too. Half human, half demon hybrids masquerading as normal people. It was a demon half breed. He wanted to play. Mostly just as nurses or police officers. And these guys are kind of interesting because to really do any damage, you first got to hit them with a vial of holy water. which removes that visage, showing them for what they really are. Then you can just administer a bit of medicine from the holiest of holy shotguns and send them on their way. By the way though, it's a pretty cool concept and almost a mandatory mechanic, because trying to kill these guys without using holy water beforehand, it's like trying to erode down a block of granite by pissing all over it. And I kind of appreciate how not every single enemy is just about using the same weapon over and over. I mean, it could have been really easy to just spam the shotgun the entire time, but there's genuinely moments here where swapping out to one of the other weapons is a lot more effective. I mean, it ain't no Doom Eternal where you've got to quick swap weapons every two seconds like you've forgotten your ADHD medication, but it's a nicely sized roster of weapons and spells to break up the tedium. Say hi to your boss for me. What is without a doubt though, the weakest element of the combat is the boss fights. Most of which are just horrid and even outright recycled multiple times. For instance, early on you fight a vermin demon, which is the same one that John fought in the movie. Should have minded your own business, exorcist. Just this amorphous shape resembling a human, but comprised of bugs and other gross little things you'd find in your mum's bedroom drawers. Didn't get enough the first time, huh? And each time you fight this guy, you'll need to use the screeching beetle items to stun it, before then knocking it apart and shooting it to bits. Then the other boss is the behemoth, named after your mum's big fat ass. <laughs> giant demon with bladed arms that's almost impossible to avoid, that just runs right up to you and bowls you over. Smack your ears, bitch. Now the trick to beating this one is to shoot the weak spots on its chest, but if you've got the dragon's breath, you can pretty much just aim in the general direction and those flames of righteousness are gonna do the rest. Now the vermin demon you only have to fight one other time, but the behemoth is brought back like five or six times throughout the whole campaign, often in really cramped areas where you've got bugger all room to move. <sighs> And I think at one point, even John makes a comment on seeing yet another one of these assholes popping up. Not again. And I don't know why developers ever think it's a good idea to just outright reuse boss fights like this, because I can almost guarantee you that no one in the history of the world has ever said to themselves after a boss fight, gee, I really wish I got to fight that thing half a dozen more times. Never happened. I get they're probably doing it in lieu of not having anything else to throw at the player, but honestly man, not fighting anything at all is preferable to just rehashing the same encounter over and over. Anyway, for the final couple of bosses, you've got Balthazar, Gabriel, and then Mammon himself, who looks a lot like the Archfile from Doom. And with the exception of Gabriel, these all rely on specific tactics to beat. You know, like actual proper boss fights. So I guess it's just a bit of a shame that out of all the bosses they could have recycled, they chose the absolute worst one. <laughs> Visually, Constantine looks about on par with whatever other games are coming out around the same time period, at least as far as consoles are concerned. 
If you compare it to PC games though, well, then that's another kettle of fish entirely. Especially considering that this was around the time when PC gaming was making that next real big leap in terms of graphic quality. I mean, consider that around that time was when we had Doom 3, Far Cry, and Half-Life 2. All really graphically impressive titles that were pushing the industry forward in some big ways. Now, I know that comparing those games to a PS2 or an Xbox game is kind of pointless, and like comparing a Toyota Prius to a Bugatti Veyron, and when put up against its console brethren, Constantine is mostly fine, just without really ever being that amazing. I ended up playing through the whole thing on the PC, only really because it was kind of hard to see what was going on with the Xbox version. And the only real handicap here is that the game's always locked at 30 FPS, which just makes mouse aiming kind of sluggish. Even by 2005 standards, this would have felt really awful, but in 2023, when I'm so used to playing at a high refresh rate that even my dreams are at 144 hertz, it's even harder to adjust to it. Since when hasn't that been true? So yeah man, like not the ideal way to play the game, but it was sure a lot easier getting through this with a mouse and a keyboard, and also a whole lot easier to see what the fuck was going on. Overall, it's got that very 6th generation feel to it, in the way that a lot of the environments are constructed. Like the way they use little tricks to simulate different effects of light coming through windows and reflections in the water. What I think is the coolest thing though, is the way that this game portrays all these hellish landscapes. And this right here is just brimming with creativity and flair. Because just like in the film, you can cross over between each area by using pools of water. In fact, even just using the spilled water from a cleaner's bucket seems to be enough. Welcome to hell, motherfucker! <laughs> then when you need to, crossing back to the real world is done by finding these lamp pools, proving that you can indeed get a glass of water in hell, contrary to popular belief. It's actually a pretty common design feature, because navigating the differences in architecture between hell and the real world is often needed to get through locked areas, or bypass otherwise inaccessible rooms. How do I get over that? Plus, it's also kind of neat in how it expands upon what they briefly showed off in the movie. And from what I remember, it was just like these really short glimpses here and there, where it kind of looked like the real world, but only if the real world had just been hit by a bomb. It's kind of like if you take what LA looked like at the start of Terminator 2 when we see the nuke going off and then just hold on that moment perpetually. It results in these familiar looking landscapes of human made buildings and structures, things like offices, city streets and highways, but then just combined with everything being engulfed in fire, heat and suffering. And truthfully, some of these areas look really awesome. I love the visual effect of how the wind is portrayed, how you can constantly see everything being blown across the screen, and the way it even has an effect on John's coat and tie is also a really cool attention to detail. In some of the areas, there's all these paintings on the wall, featuring people that are very clearly members of the dev team self-inserting. And these are animated as well, showing these guys trapped in some kind of horrible state. I don't know, maybe that's what it looks like when someone's forced to crunch on a Naughty Dog game. But even outside of that, Constantine is just packed with all these cool little details that you might not even notice. Like if you stand around too long without doing anything and John goes idle, he'll eventually pull out a cigarette and start puffing away, which even knocks off a tiny bit of your health. <coughs> There's a level set in a bowling alley at one point, and you can even shoot the pins at the end of each lane, causing the machine to reset them and send a fresh bowling ball up the gutter. Nice car! Even just the audio design is really impressive across the board, and it goes a long way in reinforcing that you're in the absolute last places that anyone would want to find themselves in, with Hell Again being the prime example. It's always just been really interesting to me playing all these different video games and seeing the way that different developers depict Hell, with Doom 3 probably being one of my favourite examples. You know, we get an entire level devoted to just exploring it. About the only issue I have with these levels is that it does often feel like it's outstaying its welcome. And I feel like these kind of levels are good if they're used sparingly. But if almost half the game is pretty much spent there, well, then it's less of a means to an end and just more of an outright focus. Especially when you're having to constantly go back there to find some kind of artifact or spell. The Nissan's dirt to my one of the last levels in the game has you completing five different trials, all of which begin by sitting on an electric chair and, I don't know, killing yourself, I guess? And this one alone goes on for a good 30 or 40 minutes. Visually, it is interesting, and the different trials all have their own theme and look, but it's outright just kind of menial by that point. 
And the ensuing chapter when you're finally back in the real world, shooting half-breeds in a corporate building, is a real breath of fresh air. Especially after all that sulfur you've just inhaled over the last couple of hours. Finally, I do think some of the puzzles are kind of pointless and often just nonsensical. Like this one here, where you gotta move around these huge ass candles and put them in the right place on a pentagram. Which as far as I could tell, is just completely troll and error. Constantine at least has brevity on its side though, and the best thing about it overall is that it doesn't feel too tedious or drawn out. You could easily finish the whole thing in one or two sittings, and all up it's not that much longer than 4 or 5 hours to get through. Which is a good or a bad thing depending on how much you enjoy shooting demons with a gold shotgun, whilst listening to someone do a half decent Keanu Reeves impersonation. Son her. Shit. Not that it should really matter, but I can't help but keep coming back to that aggregate score and wondering just what the hell people were smoking back then when they scored it so low. But it comes back to what I feel like I've said time and time again, where it's just yet another victim of a title coming out during what was really one of the golden ages of video game releases. I mean, you've got to remember, right, that this was the era when the all-time greatest video games were coming out, a time period which we absolutely took for granted, by the way. So try to consider that in 2004 and 2005 alone, we had Half-Life 2, Halo 2, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Metal Gear Solid 3, Far Cry, Fable, World of Warcraft, Resident Evil fucking 4, Fear and God of War, to name but a few. So when you keep that in mind, you can start to understand how an average run-of-the-mill shooter based off an underappreciated comic book movie didn't end up on everyone's radar. It was kind of like a time where we had an excess of excellence, if that makes sense, and had it come out any other year or not had so many heavy hitters to compete against, it probably would have fared a whole lot better. Either way though, this was the last proper game that Bit Studios ever made, and one of the only times we've ever seen John Constantine in video game form either. I see your point. This is not one of those games you'll see on the Xbox Arcade, the PlayStation Store, or remastered by Night Dive Studios. But you know what? As far as movie tie-ins go, this is still one of the better ones. Motherfucker! <laughs>